would you like to introduce yourself firstly? Um, thank you, Simon. So huge. Thank you for inviting me. As you well know, I do like to talk about timber. I love to talk with uh, architects or actually anybody, anybody within the built environment, you know, about timber and its use. Um, my background, I started manufacturing garden furniture when I was still at school. So I was 15 and I was involved in coppicing. So that's cutting down of hazel that regrows within seven years and first thinnings, which is, you know, the softwoods from our Welsh forests. I did that for 20 plus years. And we just kept building up and working more in towards the forestry. So we ended up owning our own band mills. We used to go and buy a full tonne of timber at a time and just kept buying the equipment to convert it from the logs into furniture, which we then sold into the commercial market. Um, naturally, things come to an end, a bit like circularity. You know, things are popular and then it changes. I then went to work for Coid Cymru, which is a Welsh timber charity that's all about growing more and better trees on farms for multiple benefits. So whether that's a water attenuation um, to stop flooding, to improve um, biodiversity, to improve animal health and growth, just to actually improve the land and people's lives. Within Coid Cymru at that time, we developed a TENA system. So it's a house in one night, night based on box beams manufactured from Welsh C16 timber. And it was right at the early Early days of it needed to be certified for actually commercial use. So we were at the time we were working with Elements Europe, so part of the Pickstock group, and this was before the code for sustainable homes got withdrawn. So there was four homes, three bedrooms, um, all off-site modular Welsh timber construction delivered up into North Wales. And I was being told, best thing since sliced bread. I was going, okay, so where's the proof? That led me into post-occupancy evaluation and building performance. And they were good. I mean, they used 7,000 kilowatt hours per annum per, per home at that time. Um, but there were a few issues with them. So um, but unfortunately, the government, in its wisdom, changed and withdrew the Code for Sustainable Homes. So although the TENUS is still going strong, um, you know, it didn't get ro rolled out by some of the big guys. From there, I went on to work for Wood Knowledge Wales, and we work with Powers County Council on the Homegrown Homes Project, so that more and better woodlands for, and more and better local manufacture for more and better homes, which led on to me working then with TRADA, the Timber Research and Development Association, on education, BM TRADA, on um, checking timber and timber in buildings. And my current job is with Timber Development UK as head of um, education and engagement. Pretty exhausting experience there then, Tab. You know, if, if, if I suppose if we cut you, you 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 you'd bleed timber. You bleed. Um, I shit. would. Yeah. <laughs> and Matt, would you like to provide a little bit of context as to what you've been up to? Uh, yeah. So um, I'm Matt Hayes. I'm a director at Arbor Architects. Um, I'm a, an architect and a certified pacifist designer. Um, and I'll kind of go into a bit more detail around what Arbor do in the presentation but that's yeah i'll keep it short and sweet cool thank you um tab should we start should we ask matt to do his presentation now or is there something else um, can, if i can introduce the timber in the timber yeah. first to so set the context if that's okay yeah. so i mean i think we all agree that timber grows on trees you know it's like you know milk comes well it used to come from cows but it could come from anything from nuts but you know timber as we know it comes from trees uh, and each species um takes a different number of years to grow and so when we're looking at commercial species we're looking at around 60 softwoods in commercial use and 2,000 hardwoods in commercial use. So a huge range of species. So when you say timber to me, I'm saying like, well, what species? What do you want it for? What product? Where's it gonna go? So for timber to live up to its sustainable, renewable credentials, we as users, wherever we sit in the, the design and delivery chain, need to ensure it lasts longer in use than it took to grow. So it's got to last longer in use than it took to grow. And that can be over multiple lives. We can have a cascade of use. 
Um, some timbers have a natural inbuilt durability within their sort of makeup. And this can be found in a document which is called the Durability of Heartwood Classifications. And they run from one being the most durable to five being the least. On top of that, then you want to understand where you're actually going to put your timber. So it's use classes and they run from one being um, um, the cover, undercover, you know, less moisture to five permanently sitting um, in wet salt water. But design, knowing, taking that into consideration, design plays a huge part. Um, we say simply, give a building boots, make sure it's out of the water and put a hat on it. Not a flat hat, actually a hat that sheds water, not inside the building, outside the building. But going back to the durability of heartwoods, we can increase the length of um, use of timber by um, coating it, um, by impregnating it with chemicals or modifying it by like an acetylation or thermal treatment or a combination of all these. So that hopefully is setting the scene that timber is not just timber. It's got lots of benefits that we can use. Um, it has lots of natural durability, but then by design from really good architects, we can reap all those benefits and keeping it in use longer than it took to grow. And, and how many, um, you know, some if Jasper was here from PYC, you know, what, what sort of scale do they operate at? I mean, there's an awful, there's an awful lot of um, different types of timber you just explained there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how many, how many outfits are out there bringing this to market and houses being built with um, the sorts of timber you've been speaking about? Uh, so it's different across, across our nations. Um, in Wales, it's, it, um, sorry, in England and Wales, it's between 20 and 30 percent of all homes built are um, timber frame. But in Scotland, it's up like 70, 80 percent. They have a greater a tradition than we have. And when we're talking about homes and the typologies, they could be a traditional um, timber frame, which we'd know. I'm old. Forgive me for this. A six by two or an eight by two with insulation. It could be a twin wool, which would be like a two two by twos joined together. Mm -hmm. um, Jasper's company uses um, eye joists and they manufacture a fully panelized off-site um, system. So in the factory, they will take a, um, an OSB board, they will put the eye joists with, into, onto those, they will then um, fill that with warm cell, which is the cellulose um, insulation, which again comes from trees, and they will either put a breather board or another membrane on the outside, they will wrap that and bring that to site and then install it, leaving you with a wind and watertight shell to um, carry on building. Um, but then we, we have CLT buildings, we have LVL buildings, you know, we have we have so many. We have a massive number of case studies um, if you really want to you know, get into depth on the Timber Development UK website. So if, if it's OK with you, I'll put a link into the no, absolutely. chat for that. Absolutely. And then you made you made the point about how um, it's important to design with the um, length of time the timber will be used for in, in mind i mean so when we're asking about designing for longevity gravity, is people aren't doing that then um what 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 is the issue there so timber's not really taught um in any depth across any of the professions so in architecture, it comes in as a material. And yeah, I don't think you go into depth, and I know Max can obviously corroborate this. You don't really go into depth to understand its durability and its longevity and you know where it's coming from. So you can have the species, say thicker spruce that grows in the UK, and you might be harvesting at that at 50 years. If it comes from Canada, you might be harvesting the, the same species at 80 years. So, you know, different growth patterns. So just understanding the depth of that, you know, is probably not conveyed. Engineering until recently didn't include timber. It was a and other material. I was in a talk the other day talking to 90 engineers up in Scotland. And I said, have any of you had more than one day's um, training on timber in your, um, you know, your educational career? Not a single hand went up. You know, so 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 it, we are at that level. 
Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. It, Matt, shall we, would you like to share your screen? I'll stop sharing mine and then um, get an idea of what you guys are doing. And that will no doubt generate um, questions from the guys on the call. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's see if this works. We can see that. Yep. Yeah. Great. So yeah, um, thanks for the introduction um, and tabs for going through that. It's a really good uh, context and it is um, the kind of world that we work in. Um, I suppose um, in terms of uh, Arbor Architects, we are um, a design-led practice and we aim to create kind of uh, beautiful spaces that are holistically low energy and um, that means that a lot of our projects are timber frame um, in their construction and we predominantly work on passive house projects. Um, here's some of our completed projects and ongoing projects. Um, uh, so we kind of work across sectors and the thing that ties them all together is this uh, drive for um, sustainable construction. Um, they're nearly always low energy in terms of their operational energy, but also their embodied carbon, which pu pushes us towards bio-based materials. Um, and then structure-wise, our kind of bread and butter is timber frame, sometimes like Tab is saying, like a uh, a solid timber um, or where we're aiming for passive house we'll use something more like a eye joist engineered timber frame much more like what PYC offer and then all of that is kind of wrapped in this idea of connecting to nature um, so all of our projects um, bring nature inside but also really try and uh, connect to it outside in their kind of forms and the way that the, the kind of windows are detailed um, and everything else. And um, this idea of designing for longevity and thinking about um, a kind of really robust way of designing, when we were kind of initially thinking about that and how we tackle it as a practice, a lot of it is kind of just um, kind of inherent in every in everything we do. And I suppose that's because it isn't really complicated. Um, it's it's probably what we, we all do as architects and designers and probably the, the biggest challenge is convincing clients of the kind of benefits of it and this idea of an understanding of building physics and um, using using that as a kind of way of um, convincing them of why this way of detailing or a simpler way of detailing is, is sometimes more beneficial. Um, I think summarizing it down, it, it's what Tab said actually, this idea of, you know, boots dry timber you try and keep your timber frame dry so lift it up out of the wet zone and also stick a big hat on it um and if you can you know make overhangs as big as possible and try and get you know your water away from the building the kind of next idea um is this concept of moisture management you know it, it, i suppose the biggest difference with timber is just uh managing the moisture and being very careful with that and i suppose that comes down to uh, just having a, an understanding of SD values. And we uh, work with a lot of suppliers and um, specialists for that. And, and we can come on to that in a little bit more detail. Um, the next one is this idea of, with that moisture management, this I, and breathability is a kind of term that's uh, not everyone is happy with, but I quite like it in terms of this idea that moisture kind of has to move around and you can manage it. So, um, you know, looking at what what you where your membranes are and what they're doing, and then also the outside zone of your cladding, um, how you're ventilating that, and all the kind of details. So, it's all kind of you're kind of constantly wicking all the moisture away from the building. And then the last one is this idea of just a, a simple and robust detailing. You know, we tend we've moved we don't specify any kind of hidden gutters as kind of nice and crisp as they look. We um, we go for different details and then um, we kind of avoid doing, you know, flat roofs and uh, it, it, wherever possible, just try and move to a more robust detail, try and avoid um, 
issues where you, where you think there, there might be a slight weakness. Um, and to go through that today, I'm just going to touch on two case studies um, that I've recently completed at Arbor. Um, the first one, Tim Barn, is a, a retrofit, um, and it's a pacifist and a fit um, certified project. Um, the second project is a project called Kanban. It's a it's a new build and it's fabric first. It's built to the kind of same principles as the passive ice, but it's not certified. And it came about with the clients wanting to kind of take the project, take the site off grid. So it uses quite a lot of renewables. Okay, so Timban Enefit. Um, it, it's the project came in as a, a set of ruined barns and uh, it had a planning permission already granted and the clients said to us it's great it's got planning but we want to make it passive house so that was where the project started and that that came with some challenges because it was in a real poor state of repair as you can see that there was a section there's three barns um, across the site two connected and one standalone and uh, to call them barns was a long stretch because they were, you know, falling down piles of rubble and. Um... Not, it's not strictly speaking a retrofit, is it? Or... <laughs> no, it's not. I mean, it's a very, very deep retrofit. The the first the first barn was in a better state of repair. It, it, that one we kept all of the structure. We we took a much more retrofit approach. The the other buildings was a, it was a new build. The thing that kind of complicated for us it, the planning permission was all about conversion, so we had to keep all of the existing structure. And so that is what kind of pushed it into this kind of benefit um, uh, route. The other kind of challenge was the fact it's grade two cartilage listed in connection to the farmhouse um, in the village. And it sits right on the edge of a conservation area. So it was really um, a really kind of prominent heritage um, site. And I suppose that's why nothing really has, has happened with it. In terms of the kind of layout, the barn one is the freestanding one that was much more of a, a deep reach of it, very deep reach of it. And then barn two and three are interconnected. And that was the benefit um, envelope that we tackled. And I suppose that idea was just doing more where we can. You know, it wasn't it wasn't possible to push this all the way to a really kind of high performing um, passive ice level, whereas it was with these um, buildings. And then the principle that we took with it and we take with all of our uh, kind of low energy projects is to wrap the entire building in um, basically an insulated duvet. So what we're doing is pushing all of the structure inside so it's all um, warm where possible. And what that comprises of is uh, 350 mil deep um, engineered joists, fully filmed with warm cell, um, PYC kind of specialise um, in, um, and then having a insulated raft slab um, at the base, um, an ISA quick raft slab, so that all of the structure just sits in this kind of warm, warm zone, um, and then um, passive house um, triple glazed windows and components, MVHR, and just a really simple palette of materials, driven by the client's aspiration for kind of low energy and also the agricultural aesthetic, it, it tied together quite well. Um, the kind of challenges of keeping some of the structure uh, meant that we kept all of the steel frame and um, designed the timber frame around that. And that came with some challenges about robustness and how we could uh, deal with kind of wrapping membranes and keeping it all onto the cold side and isolating them. Um, so that was that was the kind of starting challenges. And um, we worked quite closely with the structural engineer to establish um, elements for that. And we brought in um, an energy consultant to do some um, calculations around thermal bridges for some of the steel work and then what that kind of resulted in was a certified benefit passive house um, with uh, kind of really low energy um, credentials and then in terms of uh, getting into kind of some of the detailing um, this is the dutch barn which is the barrel vaulted roof um, i suppose yeah we the, the obvious ones are that it's all exposed gutters and um downpipes the the other thing that we're always constantly looking at is with timber frame um uh, moisture 
that gets trapped in that timber frame isn't good and it, it that's where we have to really be careful with the membranes um and probably why we also don't work with um phenolic foam type buildups um like uh kingspan and celotex we and that tends to not always but lend itself to sit panels we tend not to use them and work with them mainly because of the kind of risk of moisture getting trapped or um, interstitial condensation so in terms of um, the membranes we use um, on this particular project Proclima suite of um, breather membranes on no you can still hear me um, and internally we use the a combination of Intello um, intelligent membranes and a pro passive boards that, and they define our air tightness zone. And I guess because of the risk of interstitial condensation, um, we um, basically create the details and then we use external um, insulation providers or consultants to do the interstitial condensation risk analysis. And in this case, that was PYC. Um, so they ran the kind of woofy calcs and came back with the interstitial condensation analysis to prove that it was that it was all good. And I suppose ahead of getting to that point, we used the kind of rule of thumb of um, SD values, which are um, the idea of um, the resistance, the moisture resistance of uh, membranes. Um, this idea of you want really a ratio of five to one. Um, so that the outside is always more kind of moisture permeable, moisture breathable. Um, and then that's kind of just getting the detail right. I suppose then it's also managing the the kind of moisture risk through construction, um, making sure the contractor is really aware of, you know, getting things wrapped up and dry before any kind of insulation goes in. And in this case, the contractor, they had built a, a, a kind of scaffold around the old the entire building so we were completely in the dry and it was less of a risk but i mean other other than that it's kind of just managing that you know moisture in construction getting to site and then also on site if things are prefab um and then internally then thinking about the kind of moisture that's generated in inside the buildings and in this project it was um because it was a password project we had um an mvhr uh which was constantly kind of uh taking away that kind of internal moisture and providing fresh air on that Matt, just um brian had a question um I, I, you probably addressed most of it but he's talking about when the off-site when the off-site cassettes come to site and are bolted together how is the breathable membrane membrane made continuous yeah it's a big problem because um because that's it what the we've had projects where we've really challenged that where there's a kind of two approaches in there. There's one which is just completely wrap everything up and hope it's fine and hope that it doesn't get snagged and teared. Um, the other option is not to do that and to kind of wrap panels so that you can then um, tape them once they're on site. And I suppose then it's just a clever junction detail. We've done a few different options where we've brought membranes internally and then wrapped and detailed them and other ones where they've wrapped and um, overlap externally i think it's there are different solutions to them it's just always questioning you know what happens if moisture gets in and then will it get back out um traveling to site and i think we've you know that's i think that's it really and and sometimes that means having you know a, a decent sacrificial um you know covering over the whole thing so they're really protected getting to site i mean there are other things you can do as well like in terms of if i mean it wasn't a problem on this project because we it was built on site rather than prefabbed but um where it would be off site we'd then tend to look for some monitoring and uh put sensors in the wall so we can you know we can be sure that you know there isn't there isn't any areas that have been with you know missed or that are causing moisture issues um and then in terms of the um externals um Again, just this idea of simple detailing, so uh, a simple kind of uh, galvanized um, overhangs or small kind of overhangs and galvanized um, rainwater uh, pipes, which the clients are they're happy to see them exposed if they're a slightly better spec than a, than a plastic um, finish. And it, it's all nice and easy to manage and maintain if it's external. Um, 
timber cladding, we we tend to leave tree, timber cladding untreated because we like that kind of natural weathering. And on this project, we didn't do that. And we don't all, yeah, I suppose it, it varies from project to project. And I suppose there's a few reasons. One is client preference for uh, kind of aesthetics and if, if there's a kind of big overhang and we want an even finish on it and don't want to see that kind of orange burning where uh, the UV and everything, we might put a kind of uniform finish on it. And I suppose what we tend to do then is use um, a product which um, kind of allows the UV through and allows the timber to still silver. So it kind of reduces or gets rid of the maintenance strategy. And what we tend to use then is like an Osmo, an Osmo quartz type or um, CU was the, um, Product we used from Russwood um, on this project. Um, uh, yeah, so on this we used a um, a larch cladding. It started off life as a kind of hit and miss timber cladding, and then moved to just a single timber cladding and a um, mesh behind it. Um, the I suppose the the thing with all of our kind of detailing and specifications for timber and timber cladding is we just uh, go to the kind of TDUK um, or, or the old kind of charter guidance for um, timber cladding because it just, you know, it's, it's a real great resource and makes our lives easier. And then we just use that as the, the kind of go-to for, you know, fixing, you know, what, thinking about fixing specifications and uh, cladding board widths and um, and that kind of idea. Um, I guess the other thing that we can see in this detail is we have counter batten uh, and batten. So we're getting a really good vent zone in here, a good kind of 50 mil of clear vent zone. Um, um, and then that's then this kind of same detail again here. And then you can see the same kind of idea here of this idea of your, you know, your, your vapor tight on the inside and vapor permeable on the outside. So you're always trying to get your moisture to breathe out of the building. Um, and then with that idea of lots of ventilation comes with lots of insect mesh, um, getting all of these kind of zones really protected so that it, it's really breathable, but it, you're not kind of causing issues further down the line, lifting all of your kind of timber up out of the splash zone as much as possible, ideally to 200, 250 or, you know, the bare minimum 150. Um, and then um, also then thinking about, you know, what your intermittent cavity barriers need to be if, if you know you need to maintain that ventilation um, and then this is then in the smaller of the the two barns um, where we used uh, a kind of timber frame construction sitting inside this stone wall which at the beginning presented um, some questions for us around robustness and detailing um, uh, as we were kind of keeping some existing stone and then building, rebuilding new stone. Um, so, you know, really getting decent ventilated cavities um, and then get, getting the specification right on those membranes. And this is, we changed, the detailing changed as, the, as we moved across construction. Um, the, the roof remained the same, so pro plastic board and engineered joists on a, on a glue lamp frame and then the walls um change a little bit and i suppose um with that you know what what we're looking at is uh checking exposure zones and seeing how exposed the site is and then engaging with suppliers um the technical guidance that um you know suppliers uh provide is really great and uh it can really help with some of the kind of specifying of products and then the detail then of that um, corner um, ease detail. So uh, the wall build up here shifts to an Intello uh, membrane, um, a board, and then a, a more kind of uh, humidity controlled um, breather membrane by the same supplier. Um, again, this kind of vented cavity. And this just uh, idea of constantly keeping timber dry. So where if you've got timber sitting on anything that can hold moisture, putting in DPCs and uh, DPM, so it's all kind of staying dry. Um, and then getting the use classes right. So like Tab was saying with timber cladding, getting those use classes right when we're specifying them. But that, and then that also goes down to the, the kind of timber uh, specifications. So things like ply, um, using the right um, 
uh, classes for that so that um, you know the, the old-fashioned water ball ply doesn't really exist anymore so getting the use class for the glue and the timber correct for the use is, is really important um, and then that goes down all the way through to the finishes and um, timber frame um, and then I suppose then it, it, that's all fine at detailing stage but then there's a real kind of a need then to just ensure that the, the builders have understood it and that it you know that membranes are in the right place and have been lapped and all that kind of stuff on site um it's, so how much really... of, how much of a challenge is that then in terms of you know who who were the builders are they, are they were they experienced in doing this before anyone else on the call like i know alex is on the call it's not, um who might have an opinion but these the danger is that you design something like this and using these materials in this way in this manner and then for someone to come along and not really understand what they i mean is that a real issue yeah it's a very real issue <laughs> um we've done both i suppose we've worked with very experienced timber frame builders where it's um less of an issue you know you're in that that kind of safe hands of understanding and uh inexperienced contractors where we're kind of bringing them on that journey and i suppose inexperience is less of an issue as long as you're keen to bring people on that journey and that was definitely the case um uh with this project in terms of passive house the project the contractor had never done any passive house projects before but i suppose hadn't done that much timber frame before he, he was had it he had an interest in eco but not that much timber frame so um yeah, there was, uh, I suppose the, the great thing about that contractor, he asked a lot of questions, which meant mm -hmm. there was just a really open conversation about why we were doing what we were doing. And um, we were engaged by the client all the way through to completion, which was, um, which was really good. And then um, onto the second project, Kanban, um, which was a complete new build it took on a lot of the same principles so it was um, a fabric fabric first construction timber frame and it was uh, quite an exposed site um, it were the project brief was an annex to the main house uh, and then also to make the um, the project the, the kind of whole site off grid so we were looking to move off oil and to uh, get, get the site onto complete renewables um, in terms of its construction, we used a, uh, a kind of offsite panelized construction hybrid type construction where the contractor um, uh, basically used a, a big, big shed, for a better word, to uh, build up the panels and then bring them in as timber frame, non-insulated, um, but with uh, sheathing board on. Um, and it was a bit of a hybrid in that they built kind of sole plates and stuff on the site and then um, brought the panels in, um, mainly for speed and for not working in the wet was was the kind of big driver on that one. Um, it was a twin stud wall um, construction and then a, a posi joist um, roof. The slab uh, was the same principle, so an insulated raft slab. Um, and then uh, we used a warm cell in the walls. So um, the wall buildup, um, again, had deep, thick walls. So we were having the same kind of fabric performance. Um, and then managing the, um, the kind of moisture with the right membranes, both internally. Um, we used an intelligent membrane. And then externally, we used a um, Proclima Solitex. Um, and then, the kind of, I guess, crucially, on the um, southwest side where we were collecting rainwater and also where um, we needed to provide shading, we created a big overhang. Um, and then the, the kind of final detail then looks at this idea of the raft slab coming up uh, and along the edge. So the, the uh, concrete stays completely within the insulation. And then we build up a, uh, a concrete block zone, basically just to lift the timber frame up out of that um, wet zone. And then that's all fully filled with warm cell with um, all the kind of boards and membranes um, and then a vent zone up with the um, metal cladding on the front. And then I suppose another feature that happens quite a lot in our detailing, we create a service zone, which kind of protects this uh, air tightness board and um, stops any 
you know if you're creating fixings through it you're not constantly puncturing this which um creates um an air tightness leakage but also that then draws moisture through that point so that kind of air tightness zone is really important for the moisture management um in the timber frame um, and again that kind of idea of dpcs and dpm so you're keeping any kind of timber base products really dry it's really important um, and then internally um this idea of really connecting to nature so the timber uh kind of uh, runs inside to outside um and we're kind of framing the views um we used a lot of bio-based materials and um with the idea that we needed them to be durable so that kind of um uh kind of defined what what we how we were picking them so we've got an oak um floor and we've got a lime composite lime finish on the walls um and then exposed timber finishes elsewhere um and that idea that tab was saying about using the right timber for the right job so um we used a softwood timber for the um obviously the main structure and then we're using harder woods where um we need more durability where we're going to um get more kind of footfall um and the structural engineer we worked on with this um was really great in that they specified the structure and um made it so that you could instead of having just c24 everywhere for all the structure we could have some c16 and that meant we could get some british um uh timber into homegrown timber and the same with the um all of the kind of finishes um there's a really great local sawmill so we were able to get homegrown oak um for all the finishes um sorry gone no no i was just i, I was just saying yeah it looks lovely <laughs> uh and then externally we've got it's quite it's in quite an agricultural context so we've got metal cladding zinc metal cladding um and then we've got uh a, an exposed um douglas fir this is large there but it's not douglas fir um and here we treated it uh again with an osmo finish um again just to create that kind of uniform finish and uh so that it could weather evenly and then that can um fade out I suppose one of the details that we were thinking about with this idea of hit and miss, where we get these kind of really lovely um, shadow gaps, is the following that kind of TDUK trader guidance around, you know, the um, outer board having the heart out and the inner having the heart in, so that the two um, cladding boards cut together when the when so the difference between when the boards are cut and when the um variation with moisture content we're constantly just trying to get the detail to stay kind of robust when it when it shifts with moisture um uh, and i suppose that then also adds into you know the the sizings of all of these kind of timbers and the gaps and the max size for the um board widths and that also sets where the fixings go and all of this is all you know following the kind of uh charter guidance where where we can just to try and um, keep those details as kind of robust as possible um, with big overhangs. Um, and then internally, um, we don't do any fancy shadow uh, details at the base, even though a lot of clients like them. Uh, we kind of just go with a slightly uh, nicer finished skirting board. So here we had an oak to match the floor. Um, and then uh, similar kind of tin uh, oak uh, paneling for kind of hiding away TVs and that kind of stuff um and then i suppose through this process we talked to the clients about um aging and patina and that there's a bit of a process to go through so like with the oak outside just the idea that you know you have to let it you know age and uh it'll look a bit it'll look a bit ratty for a year or so and then it'll go really beautiful and silver and that's just the process and stick with it because then it means you don't have to come back and constantly you know apply you know uh, varnish and stuff to it um so it's also just that process of you know bringing clients on board um with the idea and then as the as we get through the building um it changes from quite a light space into this kind of more reclaimed timber darker space with the kind of dark floor um it's got a hidden door built into the wall um and then this idea of um just simple high quality finishes so we use the hardware and quarry tile um and then a marmoleum as we get into um the office space um 
and then in here so yeah that marmolium on the floor which is a four bow product um which is really lovely um in that it's all bio-based and at the end of life you can just you know compost it and it's all got um linseed backing and um there's kind of you know really low no voc um off gassing from them um in their production but also in occupation um and then that also defined what how you know how we were specifying some of the internal fit out so we used products like um Valcromat, which is like a, a posh mdf um uh but it, it, it the crucial difference is that it um from it's formaldehyde free so they don't use any horrible glues in it and the dyes in it are also organic dyes so uh, again that's um you know uh, really low voc um and at the the time we were um building it was the same price as furniture gray ply which does have you know all the formaldehydes and stuff in so um it, it you know it was nice to be able to use some uh products that you know we're going to be really durable and have a really lovely pattern and a kind of variation in them um but also avoid you know some of those slightly nasty chemicals and then again that kind of simple robust detailing you know uh just a, a simple architrave um and skirting wrapping around the room and then uh externally we created a kind of 1.2 cantilevered overhang and then extended the um uh the gutter out so we had a 150 mil gutter so we oversized the gutter because we knew the rainfall in the area was going to be a lot and then um created this kind of um rainwater chute which extended another um kind of 750 mil um and just really pushed the water all the way out and then made a feature of this idea of you know that it does rain a lot here and what we want to do is make it obvious so the water comes down the chute ends in this kind of core 10 um uh kind of rainwater harvester and then you can just see it then turns into a reel and drains away down into um the circle and into the drainage system and i suppose just like it, it there was uh, it was a nice design challenge and it creates a nice feature i suppose in the same way that a um a hidden gutter does but i suppose just the only slight difference is that you know it's all exposed so you can see when it's all clogged up of leaves and you can see if this isn't working um which um yeah, it's, it's it's got the same challenges, but it's kind of a little bit more interesting. Um, I think that might be it. Yeah, so that's it from me. Unless you've got any other questions. Fantastic, Matt. Thanks for that. Very um, very impressive. Um, Tab, did you have any comments on 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 both the retrofit and the, and and the new build? Anything to add? I was trying to unmute myself. I was ahead, um, yeah. I was just like oh. If all architects um, you know, went to the um, how Arbor design and obviously encourage everybody to build, we would have so much less problems and we'd have a lot happier homeowners and a lot happier timber. Um, I think, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it's so, so, so good. I think I just made one point in the chat was about the, um, the chamfer at the end. If you're having horizontal, um, no vertical padding, then if you do chamfer it back, then that will make sure that the rain drips off the front and doesn't then, then seep underneath and get sucked up the end grain. So again, you're just looking at longevity on that, you know, obviously drip grow, grooves wherever you can do. Love the fact that, yeah, you're addressing, you you know, that's what architects bring so beautifully to a project when they um, understand the materials better. You know, we are all, as human beings, fairly lazy. Most of us don't go ever go and look at our gutters. I can't even remember the time I went and looked at mine. So no, that is that is good. The um, and then as I suppose the floor, lovely again. Looking at the oak, so we do have very hard soft woods as well. So hard and soft don't mean hard wood. So you have balsa, which is a hard wood, which is incredibly soft, and then um, oak. You know, then and you, which is a soft wood, which is incredibly hard. So again, that all hard and soft. Um, all that is is their seed coverings. You have a hard seed covering or soft seed covering. So it's all to do with um, with that, not not the actual timber that comes from the plant. Um, when you change from the oak floor internally to the um, the decking outside. Obviously, you change materials, you change, you know, you change, change features again. Maybe that didn't come across quite as clearly. I know with um, decking joists now, 
that, yeah, that's exactly it, completely different. Um, and then use class four are needed for any joists that go under the deck. And then obviously buying the appropriate decking material, which again, you know, is, is it could be untreated. Love the use of SU, SU you know, seems, seems again to work really well and just absolutely beautiful. Um, I, I love what you do. Um, I would really encourage timber frame as an architect to embrace passive house or the building physics and the understanding of keeping the moisture, you know, away from your walls. It's great for human health if we can keep our relative humidity between 40 and 60 percent in our homes and offices and schools. That's absolutely fantastic. Heating them to around 20 degrees centigrade in a fairly airtight building works really, really well. It reduces our energy. Um, the moisture content of the timber is going to come down to about 10 percent you know, moisture content, and that sits really beautifully. It's when you go above 20% moisture content with a softwood timber, um, then you have the issue. It can go above 20% moisture content, but it needs to be able to dry out. So by having an airtight building and extracting your moisture um, via the MVHR system, um, you're stopping that moisture naturally going out through the walls. But again, you know, taping your walls and putting the vapour on the outside, which is five times less, uh, more permeable than the inside. Again, you're encouraging that, you know, the moisture to escape. So what's not to like? Why are we not building, um, you know, timber frame homes that last longer than they took to grow to passive house standards that possibly produce more energy than they consume? I mean, that's... Why not? Exactly, exactly. And when you and Matt, you talk about bringing the client on a journey. I mean, also whilst, whilst I was listening, I was thinking, well, this really is a bit like what Tab said. This is where the architects earn their crust. I mean, how how much how how prescriptive were the clients in this instance? Because you've obviously gone into a hell of a lot of detail here, and I mean, presumably they hadn't even considered half of it. Or am I doing them a, uh, an injustice? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think they had considered some of it, but yeah, it, it probably hadn't quite realised the amount of detail. And um, yeah, it, it's that it's that kind of REBA stage four stage, isn't it? Where you've done the design, you've got planning permission. And I think on every project, uh, the clients just want to go, great, can we get the builder in then? And don't yeah. realise that actually there's a bit of time there, quite a lot of time, where you just need to go out and you need to speak to all the consultants, you need to speak to all the suppliers and... Um, and uh bring them on board and at, at that stage i suppose what we do is we just keep it keep them in the loop so they know constantly what's happening what we're doing what we're changing what's tweaking and all that kind of stuff um but no i think uh and, and all the while sticking within their budget or trying to stick within their budgets yeah mm. and that, that kind of idea of yeah it, where ve comes in so that was like where we we changed from a hit and miss on one of the projects to a just a simba single timber cladding and again that was you know it's it's there where you know the, the detailing you know it's really crucial um where those changes happen that all that all the details are re you know redone and that kind of thing um i suppose that once clients are on board they're kind of i think a bit more um they're on that journey it's at the, it's i suppose more we find at the beginning of projects where uh no clients you know speak to different sales people and come with that idea of this is what I want to do I've spoken to the salesperson I what I really want to do phenolic foam in a sit panel and that's what I want to do modern method of construction offsite your eco you do it and um I suppose that's where we kind of spend quite a lot of time you know uh talking about the other other ideas that are possible you know things like Jasper's PYC which is a, another kind of modern method of construction completely off-site but a you know more robust way of detailing a timber frame um where you're managing that moisture a lot better in our view um uh, in case there's any sip uh, sales people on the call um uh, the and then i suppose then it's it's just managing all the all those details and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah i suppose you sort of i uh, was almost like the avatar you've just described i know so especially through this job actually you, you get to pick up on things you learn and you try and embrace them um but you still don't know enough but you hear some certain phrases and you think oh that's how that's what i want to do but then it's not necessarily uh, you don't know enough to, to to pull it off um and then 
you know your experience in delivering these types of projects and, and tab i know she's sort of uh was a question that didn't necessarily expect an answer but you know what why why isn't this happening more often where is where is the where are the challenges what more we can do i mean obviously to have your with tim development uk you're you are pushing the boundaries of of trying to get people to well, challenging challenging people to do to do more of this um and when it comes to the sme developers or the um people looking to do bespoke projects um i presume the conversations are a lot easier than just as if it was going to be bringing this type of um thought process to mass house building yeah it's so mass house building regulation you know we're moving to a new part l but is it going far enough I don't think so, not for where we are and not for the benefits that it would bring from health to, you know, reduction in carbon to actually mm -hmm. longer living homes. Um, we, we need to almost address it from every single stage. I don't know. Where did it go wrong? We have beautiful council houses that were built with love and care. And actually, you know, you, you want to go and buy an ex council house because we know they've built really well. And with yeah, people yeah. who thought, you know. The process was understanding now we've moved into building physics it seems to almost be a dirty word and somehow how we do we actually build bring building physics and you know human physiology um you know back together and actually celebrate it i mean timber development uk is taking a different tack it is starting to look at the typologies it's looking at you know the durability it's looking at the strengths and weaknesses of timber you know we know in a warming world that we will need need to definitely build differently, build to withstand storms, withstand droughts, um, massive heat, probably cold, you know, uh, we know we have the tools there to do it. How do we get everybody to take a go on that journey? We're, like Arbor, Arbor Architecture, almost it's within their DNA. I, be, I mean, they are they are um, extremely fortunate. I think they come from a, a lot ex-archetype. Archetype, again, well known for its love of natural materials. And we as human beings actually really crave natural materials. I know when I was first with Coyd Cymru and we had to do a stand to talk about what we were doing. And we got all the different species from all different suppliers, laser engraved um, them on the ends of the boards and put them up as vertical padding. And it was just beautiful to see people coming along and sniffing and touching and stroking. And, you know, it, it was, we're just drawn to natural. It's regulation, um, Simon. I, I can't see it. I mean, where we're lucky enough to have the clients who are aware and are climate literate and actually understand. And then we have the designers like Alba bringing it forward. And we have the manufacturers like Jasper who are delivering a fantastic product, um, which is probably a little bit more than the market, you know, the basic market. But surely, we, you know, if we go out to buy a car, we're not going to buy the cheapest, most basic one. Or if we're going to buy a pair of jeans, or if we're going to write, buy milk, you know, we might go and buy the organic one with, a, you know, the extra fat in it. You know, we don't always buy, you know, or sausages. Do we apply the floor sweepings or the, you know, so why do we continue doing it with homes? The places we spend up to 90% of our lives in. Why are we not actually buying the best and working with the best people. I mean, I'm here in my 1840s retrofitted terrace house. It's got cork and sheep's wool and wood fiber and lime hemp. And it's it's going to easily last for 200 years, hopefully another 100 years longer. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I could wax lyrical, but there is- No, I no, I hear you, I hear you. Um, I was going to ask you to give you a bit of a plug, because I know when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, there was there was something, there was a, um, you mentioned Grand Designs and how it was yeah. under embargo. But before we do that, um, and we're going to run out of time any any moment, and Brian has asked another question about um, ground floor. Um, uh, as opposed to asking you to come off mute, Brian, I'll just read it out. It says, um, when ground floor is suspended, can concrete slabs be avoided and timber floors introduced on helical piles as an option? Are these durable? Yeah, I think definitely, definitely it's an option. And I think one of our really early projects, actually, when we were still at Archetype, did that exact thing. I'm just wondering whether we got a photo of it. Yeah, this little building here uh, had that. So it was a timber frame, um, I-Joyce floor. Um, on um piles 
I suppose the challenge there is the sequence of construction. So how do you get your membranes on, get them lapped and taped, and then um, do it? But I suppose the same principles apply in terms of moisture management and getting the membranes right, doing the right calculations. Cool. Cheers, Matt. And then, um, well, everyone can obviously access the 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 link to Grand Designs. But when, when's that episode on? Um, tab? It's tonight at eight o'clock. Right. Okay. Yeah. So cool. Lucinda, um, who's a furniture designer, um, mm -hmm. is going to show her house for the very first time. I think there's a sneak. There's a sneak. Might be a little um, sneak sneak preview on uh, here. Yes. There. We'll break the embargo. <laughs> yeah. yeah but we're not saying where it is so so again homegrown western red um um shingles timber shingles on there yeah really watch it it is cool. again lucinda a knowledgeable client um matt yeah extremely knowledgeable client and a really great person and um you know just a, a, a driving force for incredible architecture and it's one that our, another director here at arbor was the project architect on so it's one that we hold really closely mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we'll watch that tonight and I'll um, I'll share all of your links. And when I upload the video, I'll share all of the links as well to the to the copy that goes with the recording. So, no, thanks once again for taking up your time. Um, it's great to see such passion, very informative. Um, yeah. And you've asked a lot of good questions of ourselves as well. So we should um, take inspiration from from Matt's Matt's work. And um, yes, yeah, it's very, very um um yeah much much enjoyed it so appreciate your time appreciate everyone else's time joining the call like i say i'll upload it and i'll message everyone so they get to for those that have missed out we'll get to see it and um yeah have a good afternoon everyone cheers guys thank you thank you